This Flat Earth testimony is from Darian from California. As a kid, I remember thinking about things I couldn't understand. I was fairly reserved back then, and I often asked why I was so shy. It wasn't until my later years looking back that I realized it wasn't so much that I was shy, but it was my lack of enthusiasm to engage in idle conversation, which felt trivial to me, because I was too busy already stuck in my head thinking about more complex and mysterious things at such a young age, but I lacked the capacity to articulate my thoughts. I didn't even know quite yet how to put them into question form to ask someone to explain to me what it was I was thinking about and feeling. I felt like I was noticing something everyone else was ignoring, which I now have the context to understand when I reflect back, is that I was literally wondering and asking myself at the ages of five and six, things like, how did I get here? Where was I before this? What is this place that I'm in? And things to that effect. It still blows my mind to this day to think back and now know that those types of thoughts and questions had somehow already surfaced when I had yet to really even experience life. But then again, it's not such a surprise when I consider my earliest memories. I couldn't have been older than three years old when I had this series of recurring dreams. In the dream, I was in the sky looking down and it was always daytime. There was nothing but landscape below, which was a tan brown like the dirt of desert terrain. And there, from way up in the sky, I would begin to descend, at first slow, but increasing in velocity the closer I got to the ground until it was a full-blown freefall. And of course, every time, just before I would hit the ground, I would wake up. The kind of awakening that jolts you forward in bed, accompanied by a dropping feeling in the pit of your stomach. I always found it cool to be able to remember my first dreams in life, but it had never occurred to me until I was into my 20s to ask myself, how on earth at that age could I have possibly had any concept of falling from the sky? I always knew dreams were significant and designed for interpretation, but I wasn't sure how or by who. But it's things like those memories which, for me, not only demonstrate that we are infused with a deep-seated intuition, but also that those types of faculties seem to be the strongest and most keen when we are young. When we are pure before we are tainted by the cruelness of the world or influenced by the harshness of people who forcefully teach us how to behave and how to think, coercing us into a state of submissive obedience before we forget. Unfortunately, I began to fit that bill for a while myself and lost connection with the feelings I had as a young child. I began to accept what I was told at face value, though many of the questions remained. My parents enrolled me in a Catholic school for a while, though none of the teachings there resonated with me on any level, because, to be quite frank, I found it all very boring. I don't know if it was the method of presentation or that I was simply meant to learn from all my lessons on another path, but I knew that religion, quote-unquote, was not for me. When I reached middle school, I became academically indifferent, habitually lying to my parents in homework and failing classes. I even remember reaching a point that I took a sense of pride in how well I was able to tell completely improvised lies and make them believable. Of course, I eventually lost my parents' trust, and I seemed to have sort of lost interest in any notion of the future or what it might hold if I didn't, quote, do good in school. I was overtaken by apathy. So naturally, the rest of my schooling was an intellectually unremarkable experience, pretty much up until the end of high school, when I had finally taken an interest in reading. Thanks to a certain book one of my teachers had included on a mandatory reading list. It was the first time I'd ever read an entire book on my own strictly because I wanted to. As was the case with the next several books I went and rented from the library that summer, even though the first book was the only one that was required for my class. That was the point I now view as the beginning of my active search for wisdom and knowledge. Once I started attending community college, I started reading books like The Alchemist and The Celestine Prophecy, both of which are centered around the concept of coincidence. I had also enrolled in several psychology and philosophy classes around then, which happened to be on the first of any class that I'd ever taken that genuinely piqued my interest. It all seemed to come together, and I developed this new way of thinking, like the notion of coincidence was an actual energy or force interacting with those who paid attention to the signs, and that if you paid attention enough, you begin to vibrate at a higher frequency or higher consciousness, and all this was the spirit trying to align with its destined path. Studying ancient Greek philosophy was the first time I felt at home in the classroom, Hearing all these ideas I myself had thought of in the past finally put into words. I couldn't believe there were actually people so long ago who had wondered so many of the same things. Once I got through my philosophy class, I felt as if I had a new mind to process the world with. Sadly, it was around that time that I also picked up some less than desirable habits. I had already been smoking and drinking heavily for some time when I befriended a nice-seeming fellow who was maybe six or seven years older than I was, who was always inexplicably eager to give me free pills. The scary part looking back was that I never actually knew which pharmaceutical drug I was getting into. He'd just walk into class, sit down at a desk ne next to me, and reach over and drop something into my hand before telling me the name of it, and that was it. 
and I, being as naive as I was, would take it. The only one that I specifically remember him giving me one day was Xanax. Because I remember him saying to me, Now be careful taking this one. Don't take too much at once, because this stuff can literally alter the chemistry of your nervous system. I'll never forget that. But it isn't because of what he said, it's because of what began to happen to me shortly after. I don't suppose I'll ever know if it was a direct result of taking any of those pills, or if it's simply from growing up on an all-American diet, or from breathing in all the toxins in the air, or, the, or an emerging side effect from one of the many vaccines I received in my youth, but over the next several months I began to experience some very radical changes which still affect me to this day. My mental health seemed to take a sudden turn in a very dark direction. I became plagued with things I had never experienced in my life, like a debilitating anxiety coupled with a myriad of horrifying physical sensations that I can only describe as the sensation of dying. I quickly developed a sort of hypochondriac personality and eventually lost count of the number of times I rushed to the hospital, afraid of the worst. There was a constant sense of impending doom surrounding me. I became obsessed with death. I stopped locking doors in my house so that my parents could always get into my room in case something happened to me. I started a blog where I characterized death as a person in every piece I did, attempting to make light of my very bleak perspective. As much as college studies had helped me expand my mind, it also made me that much more capable of thinking in circles. I seemed to have inadvertently built a prison of fear around my own psyche and I could not escape, because I could not circumvent such obstacles as meaningless and nothingness. I became as philosophically and spiritually charged as I could manage and developed my own sense of calm, learning how to master my anxiety. I convinced myself that there was meaning to our brief lives surrounded by darkness. I had adopted the quote, New Age worldview, through and through. And for a number of years, that's pretty much the shell I stayed in, believing, because I had to, that there was something divine out there, and that I had to be going through some phase of necessary life lessons. Ironically, it was during my college years that I had first seen the documentary Zeitgeist, and was thoroughly convinced that there was no definitive God, or authority, or that Christ himself was nothing more than a myth. Among other things, it was also around that time, leaving community college due to severe depression and lack of enthusiasm for life, since I'd become so intimate with my own mortality, that I also became more aware of things like the Federal Reserve Banking System and the Illuminati, which only served to worsen my outlook on life at the time. So I wrote about that too. I reached a point where I decided, you know what? If none of it matters and we're all going to die, then I may as well be honest. And that became one of my primary pursuits. To rectify the way I'd been in the past, and to at least hold one principle dear. To be a man of integrity. To just tell the damn truth, since it seemed like no one else wanted to. And that's how things went on for some years as I studied and learned. I knew there was some sort of shadow government comprised of a select number of exceedingly wealthy elitist bankers who essentially called the shots in almost every facet of the socio-economic structure through no small measure of manipulation. I knew they could control political dialogue for their benefit if they needed to, or steer their narrative concerning literally any topic covered by the mainstream media. I knew a great deal of facts and details in history had been distorted or outright manufactured, but was never sure to what extent exactly. I knew about the agenda for the New World Order, and the potential of people someday to be microchipped, though I later became skeptical as to how necessary it would be for them to go to that length since almost every individual these days is walking around with a computer in their pocket. I knew those in power had monopolized the Earth's natural resources and could set the standard to influence the market in any way they saw fit. Although I had come to be suspicious of exactly how, quote, scarce certain things were, especially in light of so many people becoming more self-sustaining by going green. And that was where I got lost, feeling like I had descended into a rabbit hole that had no bottom, because I could not find any rationale that could adequately answer why. Why all the conspiracy? Why the need to subjugate the people of the world? If there are all these technologies that can benefit mankind, then why are they being suppressed? Why hide the cure for cancer? Why is clean, renewable energy taking so long to integrate into our way of living? Why, if they are able to mass-produce food, are there still people starving? None of these examples ever seem like things that would even affect the status quo or, or threaten their luxurious positions if they were to change. So to simply chalk it up to greed never made sense to me. It always seemed more ominous and more intentional than just a class of selfish, wealthy people who were afraid to lose their footing. I'd had so much of the puzzle for so long, but I couldn't put my finger on a few final things to bring it all together. Why was there still evil in this modern day when there's clearly enough of everything for everyone in the world to live comfortably? I found myself humbled one day in mid-2015 after yet another severe panic attack, possibly the worst I'd ever had. I actually felt like my heart was in the process of ceasing to pump, like there was an empty pocket of air in my chest that would swell up in waves of physical terror. As I laid back on the couch and made my usual, I love you, I think this is goodbye phone call to my mother, I remember calling out to, the, quote, the spirit, and thinking in my heart and mind, if this is my time and this is what is meant for me now, then take me, I trust you. 
Shortly after, the paramedics came, and of course it all subsided, making me look like a paranoid fool in front of my handful of friends who I regretfully admit were present during a handful of my mental episodes. Sometime later, a few days perhaps, I recall going down into my room and feeling this state of total content. I've been so utterly humbled so many times over the past six or seven years by my quote, near-death experiences, or at least they felt that way to me, and in my state of complete humility, something came over me. I stood there in my room, alone, in complete silence, looking up and smiled, and I said out loud, Jesus, if you're really there and I'm meant to believe in you, I know you'll make yourself known to me. I stood there for a few moments, and then I continued to smile as I walked out of the room. To this day, I can't describe what the exact feeling was that came over me, or why I chose right there to address Jesus directly, but I can say that I was not being sarcastic or joking or testing out God or anything like that. It was like a sense of knowing, somehow. I was sincere, and it was the first time in my life that I didn't feel weird about acknowledging Jesus as more than a fairy tale character, which immediately brought this wave of comfort over me. And wouldn't you know it, my call was answered. That same week, as I had finished watching a video concerning another topic I was researching, was a Flat Earth video before me. I'd heard about it for months and had dismissed it as not even being discussion worthy. The fact that people were beginning to readopt a centuries old belief was the most absurd, laughable thing I'd ever heard. But for some reason, in that moment, I knew I was meant to investigate what exactly was getting people so worked up. I thought of Aristotle who said, it is the mark of an educated mind to be able to entertain a thought without accepting it. And with that, I plunged in head first. Not even five minutes in, I already knew something was wrong. Nothing in my heart and soul had rejected anything yet. In fact, the several proofs I had seen thus far all made a terrifying amount of sense. I was sure I'd be shaking my head with every single word of such nonsense, but my gut was telling me right from the start that I understood it because it was logical, and I had in fact always understood. I laughed and thought to myself, all right, hold on just a minute, there's no way, the earth is a globe, I know this. And as I began to take it more serious, suddenly about half an hour of investigating had turned into five months of non-stop research. It became a daily obsession, looking for holes and continually finding none, which only kept drawing me in deeper. The more I tried and the harder I looked, the less I came up with to refute the evidence before me. And I can say now that, despite the discrepancies made in some Flat Earthers' arguments, such as the exact size and shape of the Earth or the actual distance of the Sun and Moon or their nature, etc., those discrepancies are negligible compared to the many solid proofs that demonstrate an enclosed, flat, unmoving world with heavenly bodies that are small relative to the Earth and local. There was only one manner in which I was able to regard the existence of this lie once I had uncovered it, and it is one of the greatest hurdles for anyone who is in a strong state of denial as I was. I knew it was a lie told deliberately, which meant a number of people in certain organizations were in on it, which meant it had a purpose, a prime directive, and the only purpose I could distinguish as a logical explanation to me was to hide the creator by hiding the true nature of the creation. I had it. Finally, after a lifetime of unanswered existential questions while living in a society that demands the acceptance that everything is relative, I'd found that piece to the puzzle I'd been looking for. Only now I realized that it hadn't been missing. I'd simply been rejecting it all along. There is not only a secret group of wealthy elites controlling the world. They are, in fact, Satan-worshipping members of the occult, and all the games they play begin to make sense as soon as you start looking through the lens of faith. Everything you've ever heard about the Illuminati, or the agenda for the New World Order, or the Luciferian characteristics found in so much of the entertainment industry, or any one of the many signs and symbols hidden in plain sight all around us. It all starts coming into focus as soon as you recognize the reality of God, as well as that of the devil, whichever happens to come first for you. The main focus of the Flat Earth Movement is not only to expose lies, but more importantly to bring people to God, or at least try to point them in his direction. Because that's what this research does. Once you've accepted the Earth as a flat, stationary plane, around which everything else revolves and is an enclosed system that we cannot leave, you then have to acknowledge in the same breath that it means the Earth is creation. Those realizations go hand in hand. And once you recognize creation, you find yourself in the presence of the Creator. And it shouldn't take you long to figure out who He is specifically. Which is why if the time you invest in researching Flat Earth is a genuine and objective pursuit of truth, then that pursuit and the path to finding God are really an inseparable endeavor. And everyone who says otherwise, like the flat earth as a psyop or another deception or an unimportant distraction, I would strongly urge them to put more thought and consideration into those conclusions because the results beg to differ.
To put it in simpler terms, the purpose of Flat Earth Movement is not to prove people wrong. It is to prove that God is right. It is the answer to the why question I had been asking for so many years. Why such evil and enslavement? Why so much corruption throughout history? So many lies. It is the same question people ask of Flat Earthers. Why would they lie to us? What would be the point of such a grand manipulation? Flat Earth, or geocentricism, signifies a deliberate, intelligent creation set with a purpose which offers a palpable sense of genuine meaning to the lives of every individual who recognizes God, the creator of all things, whose presence can be felt working in the hearts and minds once they are made open to the truth. He is in everything, always, and his word is absolute. You begin to see the implicit value in all things. Even on those days things aren't going so smooth for you because you recognize that it is all in accordance with his plan, and it is all ultimately for your benefit, even if you don't understand how until years later. I say that humbly from experience. The globular earth or heliocentric model effectively hides God and has the exact opposite effect on our collective sense of purpose, because our very existence is trivialized by the accepted reality of the various chance circumstances that cause the universe to exist. Once upon a time there was nothing which was nowhere, and since time didn't exist, I guess that nothing which was nowhere was also never? And then for no reason, nothing exploded and became everything everywhere, which now hurtles aimlessly through this infinite expanse forever towards nowhere. And over an immeasurable amount of time, things began to form because of this invisible force called gravity that can't be explained, which accidentally caused you to eventually exist after this process of evolution took place, but can't be observed. And here we are like an insignificant speck of dust on a cosmic scale among trillions of others, while all meaning is relative and morality is defined by each individual's personal understanding of spirituality or lack thereof which is a spiritual sense that is established by picking and choosing specific views from different theories and ideologies to piece together a personalized singular worldview that meets all the requirements for, quote, transcendence, while catering to each individual's desire for divine meaning and purpose. So, like a child, even if you lose the ball game, you still get a trophy. Everybody wins because hashtag all worldviews matter. That's the point of the lie. To rob you of the truth takes away your connection with God, which steals all meaning and makes you relative while making them the absolute authority and keepers of truth, not God. They control your way of thinking and behaving, not God. They decide your fate and shape your future, not God. They cannot take away your ability to choose God, but they can make your choices appear more limited. By obscuring the nature of reality, they effectively trivialize your existence and pervert the intuitive bond you have with God at birth, leading you astray hurting you into a life of ambiguity, and all the while people are more assured than ever that the notion of God is obsolete, because the technology we have at our disposal combined with an arsenal of completely conflicting spiritual philosophies must be the evidence that we are on the cusp of evolving beyond a need for a divine savior. People are certain that in this new age era, they will soon begin to transcend this material plane and will escape the shackles of death, shedding all fear as they unite with the divine, all on their own. If my body is dying, I'll just become something else. If our planet is dying, we'll just go somewhere else. They don't believe they need any saving, so they've essentially claimed the power of God by presuming we can save ourselves. Knowing what I know now, and having just escaped that exact way of thinking, I assure you it is not the shape of the earth that concerns me so much as the shape of your mind. Unfortunately, from the experiences I've had in attempting to open up a dialogue, I'm convinced that there's no amount of rhetoric that can make someone place their faith in Jesus simply because I'm telling you they must. Nor is there any amount of infallible logic that can be presented in a case for flat earth that will not be reflexively rejected. I understand now that there is something that must take place first, inside a person's heart and mind before they can be receptive to ideas that contradict their current understanding of the world. There is a certain inexplicable feeling that develops from within. For me it came as a sort of reminder that I knew absolutely nothing at birth and I was raised by people who were born under that exact same circumstance, as well as those before them, and so forth, and that perhaps nobody really knew anything. Many people are frustrated by Christians and wonder why so many always feel the need to preach to you and insist you repent, etc., because it feels like they're forcing their beliefs onto you. But I assure you that isn't the intention, at least not of a true Christian. Unfortunately, the actions of just a handful of radicals who claim the same faith can taint the image of the entire collective and distort the way a community of grace is viewed by everyone else. So we live in an age where Christians are often persecuted and are automatically labeled stupid, irrational, or mentally unstable. I remember seeing them that way myself only a few years ago when I was avidly and outspokenly opposed to God and so-called, quote, organized religion. 
The most frustrating thing for any follower of Christ trying to convert someone is that we know. To know the truth, you have to understand the gospel. But to even understand the gospel, you must first know the truth. This is why so many have taken up the flat earth as their endeavor to spread the truth, because it literally provides an empirical basis which you can test and verify the existence of God simply by looking at the evidence of his creation. His fingerprints are all over the place, and if you just block out all the noise for a second and look closely, you will see it. It is the furthest thing from an outdated belief system, and the proofs just keep piling up. I had no desire to discard an entire lifetime of beliefs. To dismiss the notion that I myself and my New Age mindset was not the ultimate divine energy awaiting eternal spiritual oneness with whatever mysteries awaited, and that there actually was an authority to which I owed my respect and gratitude and worship, a specific being to whom I owed my life, literally. I clung quite desperately to the notion of an outer space which had always fascinated me, though I was also equally terrified by the idea of an infinitely vast vacuum of black nothingness surrounding us in all directions. But I also have to admit I had never personally analyzed the data regarding any theories in cosmology before I accepted them as fact. I never scrutinized any claims about the Earth or supposed discoveries made in outer, outer space. I just accepted it all immediately. Despite a complete lack of understanding for these mind-bending concepts, and in the total absence of any evidence to support the theoretical claims being made about invisible forces or celestial events taking place, I would always trust what, quote, scientists have discovered, because trusting them was all I had ever done. What reason did I have not to trust them? I learned the hard way. It's when all the math fails, when none of the theories can be reconciled, and so another theory is placed underneath the stack to support the foundation of the original. When evidence can't be provided or an experiment can't be replicated, yielding results that can only be defined as, quote, inconclusive. When there is literally zero curvature that can be detected at any given altitude. When scrutinizing NASA or any other organization dedicated to aeronautics shows how little of their testimony actually holds up if it is examined more closely. And when all the proofs presented by the Flat Earth are logically consistent and scientifically verifiable by anyone. I've done the research on both sides and tried to disprove both models. Only one stood the test of time. I have no agenda. I have no need for a spiritual crutch, as I've already iterated my many encounters with death and often expected total oblivion. I have no need to feel like I know something that others do not. You just cannot deny logic, whether the conspiracy seems likely to you or not. My only bias is towards the truth, and the truth is that the earth is flat, exactly as it was designed by Christ himself. As it says in Psalm 85:11. Truth shall spring out of the earth, and righteousness will look down from heaven. I repented and asked Jesus into my heart and keep him in my thoughts as much as I can throughout the entire day, every day. I have not repented perfectly, I still misstep at times, and I still have to actively avoid my sinful desires, but I have changed because I am saved, and I will continue to change until I am made into whatever tool it is my purpose to become for God's will to be done. Namely, to pray that those with ears to hear will hear and that they too may also be saved. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video presentation. If you did, please subscribe to my YouTube channel, like the video, and share it on your favorite social media sites. There's a lot more to come, so stay tuned, and we'll see you back next time.